morning, good afternoon. If you're listening uh, in Europe right now, it is Friday, right this very minute, and uh, we are finishing up a volatile week. This is Risk and Rewards, and we're still authors on the ECB Carboid. And I think that the theme of the week has to be how much did the ECB and their decision to come out, stay where they are, but at least accelerate the end of their pandemic purchase program, change the game out of next week's Fed meeting. Yeah, I'd agree completely with you, Lisa. That, that in terms of um, in terms of the markets, obviously everybody's most concerned in general about about the situation in Ukraine. But in terms of the financial world, how the world is going to respond, uh, I think we saw a very significant meeting yesterday. We we it's not so long since Christine Lagarde was desperately trying to say that she wasn't going to be that hawkish, trying to reassure people that, that she didn't need to be as aggressive as other central banks. Uh, and at this point, the, uh, the the ECB is more or less in the vanguard. Uh, I think one point I, that interested me immensely, obviously, obviously Europe has had much more of a deflationary problem, low, you know, negative rates uh, for many years. We had seen... Um, inflation break-evens for Germany almost reach those for the US in the last few weeks. There was gathering concern that the ECB wasn't going to be able to deal with this. Uh, and those lines have separated very dramatically in the last couple of days. That, that, that uh, This has very much changed the market's perception of where inflation is going in Europe. Taking a step back, obviously the main story and the backdrop of everything that we say has to do with Russia's invasion of Ukraine the fallout in the commodities market and of course uh, the non-market story which is a humanitarian crisis that we're all watching unfold and the response to it i mean it's got a market implication in addition to a, a dramatic humanitarian one on, on pretty much every level the problem is for central bankers and this is really uh it was elucidated by the ecb decision this week they're dealing with something that looks a lot like stagflation which is basically a central banker's nightmare and nobody really understands how they're going to respond because it's unclear what they're supposed to do, whether they're supposed to tighten into uh, what is a slowing economy. And people expected the ECB to be dovish. And there was a strain of thought out of Deutsche Bank and others saying, look, they have to act a little bit more hawkish than people expect in order to support the euro, because otherwise you're going to see it keep falling out of bed, which will just exacerbate the inflationary pressures. So that really was the takeaway in some ways, that they know that they don't want to let inflation get out of control and that fear of 1970s mm -hmm. is worse than uh, than hiking too soon. How much, and, and here's the real issue, and I, and I think that your point comparing the Fed and the ECB is an important one, how much does this set the stage for possibly seven or eight hikes this year from the Federal <laughs> Reserve that's currently is priced into the market, right? How much yeah. does this set the stage for them to come out and say, look, our mandate is to prevent runaway inflation. Obviously, this is a stagflationary shock, but we need to respond to our mandate. Yes, I think that's quite likely what is going to happen. I've certainly had lots of people, uh, this, this was chatter that has largely ceased in the last 24 hours, saying the Fed is going to have to be more dubbish than it wanted to be next week. They'll still have to do their 25 bips hike but they, they can be much more uh, circumspect about whether they'll do any more and then then stocks will be off to the races i heard that version from quite a few people uh i find it very far-fetched at this point um uh the you know the, the central banks are, are now part of uh part of taking a lead against this and also the uh i, I mean the, you know the, the 73 com comparison continues to, to look, unfortunately, stronger and stronger. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, and alas, the Yom Kippur War is actually over after, I think, 15 days. So, so, which is, we're up to day 15 in, in Ukraine. So in some ways, this could be a, a worse, a worse, more shocking event. Um, but the key points that were about that event were, first of all, that inflation was already taking off because the money supply had expanded. In that case, because of, uh, Nixon leaving Bretton Woods, taking on taking off the gold paper this time around because of all the desperate measures for the pandemic two years ago, um, <clears throat> and both times it involved an ongoing embargo. This time the West imposes the embargo upon itself. The time before it was 
uh, OPEC employ imposing the embargo on it, but the economic impact is the same. So the similarity of the event, yes, the world is a different place 50 years on, but the, there is no better analog. Uh, and history, we, we know what didn't work, which was not hiking too aggressively. Therefore, I suspect that they're going to at least make a different mistake and see what happens this time if they do hike into it. Well, I do think, though, and this is something that I've seen quite a bit of, the mm. differences between the, between now and the 1970s include the fact that we consumed a lot more oil per yes. GDP unit back then. Yeah. It yeah. was much more essential to the overall growth outlook of the yeah. United States. And you have the offsetting feature of possible fiscal stimulus, particularly in the Euro region, right? We hear about more... Yeah. Um, you know, in addition to military spending, which I think uh, people have written about being stimulative, but with an asterisk around it, there has been discussion about, you know, spending on greener infrastructure and other types of development that's been sought after for a long time. They just never could get the funding. So how much could that actually act as a boost that offsets some of the uh, the decline? And that's actually talking about the contrarian view that I find most compelling right now, just to bring that forward. I find it interesting the arguments that Europe will actually do better than people are currently pricing in because of some of the fiscal output. So because of some of the fiscal support that will get implemented, it's a stretch. There are a lot of things that have to happen, but you know, that's where some people are looking for a possible offset from the 1970s. And the other issue with the 1970s is we did not have negative real wages. We have there negative is. real wages right now, which is not good, right? People's in wages are not keeping up with inflation. Back then they were, so it could allow it to go on for longer than it is now. Um, well, the, the great risk there is that we will, uh, well, risk people. People deserve to be paid money to, to, to account for inflation. Um, the risk is that we do get a wage price spiral beginning. Uh, if you looked at the Atlanta Fed wage tracker details from yesterday, I, you know, they were uh, on many different measures. They were the fastest wage wage growth they've plotted since they started the survey, which is in '97. So you know th this is th there is this concern that that difference may no longer be a difference for much longer, um, which I think is uh, is 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 uh, is critical to this. I, I, I certainly agree, though, that the the uh, we're a much less oil intense economy. Oil per se does not hurt as much as it used to, certainly not as much as it did in 73. But um, if you look at the proportionate increase in the share of gasoline that um, ga the gasoline takes of total spending, it's as big a shock even as in 73. This was, uh, it was Omer Sharif, I quoted from Inflation Insights, came up with this number. The only bigger shock was Hurricane Katrina uh, in 60 years. Uh, and that was that was an ob obviously one that was easier to, to deal with than, than, than this one. It was easier for it to go away quicker than, the, than, than this one will be. And actually, just to put some numbers on that, I mean, we saw the, the, the cost of a gallon of gas the average cost of AAA unleaded across the United States has increased by about a dollar since the end of December. Just to give you a sense, I mean, a dollar on the gallon to more than four dollars and twenty-seven cents. That's how quickly it's rising. And Michael Gapin of Barclays came out uh, this week and was talking about how the pace of the increase matters more in terms of crimping com consumer spending and consumer sentiment than even how high the absolute level goes because it's how much people see at the pump every day that they pass it, how much that increase every day goes up. Yeah, and petrol. And this is a problem for the Fed because obviously gas is one of the ones they have least control over. But yes, you, you, you are very aware of the price of it because you actually see the price on big billboards as you drive past. <laughs> it's um, true. Not only is it something you buy quite regularly and costs quite a lot of you know, big part of your budget, but you really are very conscious of uh, of the way that price is moving because of the because of the way it's advertised. So um, psychologically, uh, gas prices are probably almost as important as in, in the short run, or almost as important as the whole of the rest of uh, the CPI put together in terms of how instantly people know about it and feel it. Um, I do think, though, that 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 adds to the argument that uh, um, you know inflation 
we're getting to a tipping point where inflation becomes an enemy of growth, where it eats into growth by messing, you know, distorting pricing signals, by um, uh, affecting confidence. And we saw a dip in New Michigan confidence figures today, which unfortunately, therefore, adds to the argument to take the pain, if necessary, to deal with inflation first. Again, that's my um, you know, small c conservative reading of from history of what I think I would do if I were the Fed, and I'm glad I'm not on the Fed. Um, and that's my best prediction of what's going to happen: that they're they're going to they're, they're more prepared to take the risk of hiking too much than hiking too little. Well, that's what a lot of people are betting. If you take a look at Fed funds futures, right, seven or eight times yeah. this year. I just wonder what the transmission mechanism is. If it is really priced in, which a lot of people think it is mm -hmm. to markets, or at least that's what they say, yeah. then how does that actually reduce inflation, especially when a lot of the inputs are out of the Fed's control, especially when a lot of people who are buying houses, which is the rent mm -hmm. component, which is also a big part of the CPI, yes. how much, uh, you know, the fact that they're buying with cash, that they're not buying necessarily even with mortgages, yes. means that that isn't going to really make a difference when the mortgages, the mortgage level goes up that much. I mean, there are all of these aspects of the Fed's ability to bring down inflation the way that they used to, especially mm. uh, given the fact that markets have already had a disruption. And mm. if you get more of a disruption in credit, then the Fed's going to be a little bit more concerned about, you know, torpedoing the growth in trying to get to the inflation goal. I I'd certainly agree. That's a very important point. The, the, um, the credit dog still hasn't really barked. Um, I mean, yes, you've seen spreads rise but in terms of any real great anxiety about about uh, in the credit market it's still not really there in a way that might have might have happened given the kind of shock in the rest of the economy um however it, there are different parts of inflation that, that it's possible for more than one thing to be to be going on at once um uh i find quoting the atlanta fed again that the, the way they, they they have a data series where they they split prices into flexible and sticky and the flexible price increase is actually faster at this point than at any time even in the 70s uh, so plainly there is a huge transitory element to this that it's absolutely reasonable to expect will begin to come down however the sticky price inflation which is nowhere near as high as it was in the 70s when everything became unmoored um, is at its highest in 20 years now it seems to me that's the kind of thing that you can hope to uh, to address to affect with classic monetary policy, with tightening the supply of money, with tightening uh, tightening interest rates. Um, so no, there's, there's, they're, they're powerless to deal with what will be vitally important: the gas prices. But I still suspect they what they need to do. Well, just to sort of give you a sense, though, of how officials are thinking about this. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen yesterday in an interview said, we're likely to see another year in which 12 month inflation numbers remain very uncomfortably high. And this from someone who was saying uh, not so long ago that inflation was transitory. So yes. as you take a look at that composition, clearly Treasury Secretary and Fed officials are doing the same thing. And the picture that they come back with is, wait a second, this isn't going away. And then how does that affect the expectations that people have. And we saw that also, you mentioned the University of Michigan survey. Yes, sentiment was at the weakest going back to 2011, but arguably more interesting even. I mean, that's very interesting. Just as interesting is the one year ahead inflation forecast, which was expected to come in at 5% and came in at 5.8%. And actually that's the fastest pace going back to 1981. So you look at the expectations, and you go back to this theory of expectations determine the actuality because that's where people are. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I find that really interesting. Before and we're running out of time, I don't know how we are because there's so many things that we haven't gotten yeah. to. Yeah. I do want to just say that the thing that caught my attention the most this week is very basic, mm -hmm. and that's will people in Ukraine be able to go and plant and till the ground and be able to get the crops? Yes. ready for the harvest uh, later in the year. And, and the reason why is because if they can't, we, we saw, um, you know, the prime, the prime minister today, the president, excuse me, come out of Ukraine and say, we're trying to get them back into the fields, even as the bombs fall, because the world depends so much on this breadbasket. And I do wonder if we don't get some sort of reprieve in time 
to make sure that this soil is used in the way that it's relied upon around the world, mm -hmm. what kind of social unrest we end up with. If we see that surge as the United Nations is expecting of 22% in, uh, in, in the global price of, uh, of food. I, I can only agree with you. That's terrifying. That could ultimately, certainly in the emerging world where you've got the double whammy because the emerging market currencies are weakening. So, so you add that on to the increase in the expense of Ukrainian wheat or whatever, that's you know potentially even more damaging for the global economy in the longer term than the impact we've already had on the oil price. And for all those watching, please bear in mind, we still care far more about the lives of decent, honest Ukrainians, but it's our job to look at the economy. So this is what we, so we, this is also very important, but please don't think we're totally cold blooded and only care about, uh, about grain prices rather than about uh, lives well, being ruined. But, but yeah. grain prices are lives too, right? Yeah. I mean, that's something else that's important to note is that you start looking at, you know, true malnourishment if you start to yeah. get food shortages. So, you know, that's part of the story. True. But yes, ultimately, we're yeah. thinking about, you know, all of the other uh, very important uh, and, and yeah. frankly, outbreaking stories. Yes. Well, I hope that you have a good time uh, this weekend, managed to, despite right. the news flow and uh, 